worship service here at King City Bible Church. Uh, Pastor Jim, uh, it's great to have you uh, join us today, and I hope today I find you all safe, well, uh, joyous in the Lord. Uh, we find ourselves in God's Word today in Mark chapter 6 once more, this time looking at verses 7 through 13. Let's begin our reading this morning. Mark chapter 6, beginning in verse 7. Calling the twelve to him, he sent them out two by two and gave them authority over evil spirits. These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you leave as a testimony against them. Then they went out and preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. And let's go before the Lord in prayer uh, before we dive into the word. Lord, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for the truth of your word. We pray that your spirit would speak to us through your word today. Guide us through it. Help us to understand it. And uh, may our study of it draw us into a deeper, richer, relationship, Lord, uh, with you. Lord, I pray for those who are suffering this morning that you would bring them comfort, Lord. I pray for those this morning who are feeling lonely and isolated, that they might know your companionship, Lord, they might know your friendship. Lord, I, I pray for those this morning who are maybe feeling cheated, perhaps they're feeling betrayed, Lord, may they know your faithfulness. May they know your loyalty, your companionship, Lord. Lord, I, I pray for those this morning who are just grieving. Uh, Lord, may they know your peace. May they know that rest that only comes, Lord, from you. I pray for those who are feeling just so weakened and broken today, Lord. May they know your strength. May they know, may they know your power, Lord. I just, uh, just want to lift up uh, all these people to you, uh, Lord. There's so many in need, and the most wonderful and amazing thing, Lord, is that you are able to meet each and every need. You are able, more than able, to meet each and every person where they are on their journey, to provide for them all that they need to continue on with you. May that be so. I pray that we would not lose faith but we would continue on. Help us, Lord, to be your servants. Give us all that we need. Equip us constantly, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, uh, last week we were in Mark chapter 6, and we looked at verses 1 through 6, and we saw that Christ Jesus, the servant of Jehovah, was rejected in his hometown of Nazareth. And we also saw that because of their unbelief in Christ, the power of God, that truly divine power, was actually restrained. And we had read in verse 5 of Mark chapter 6 last week, it tells us that he could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And now this morning, uh, we're seeing that the servant of Jehovah sends forth his servants to preach his message. Uh, and in verses 7 through 13 uh, that we've read, we see here the uh, third tour of the Galilean villages that our Lord Jesus takes uh, as recorded by Mark. Uh, we can see the first, if you were to go back to the first chapter of Mark, uh, Mark chapter 1, verse 14, uh, the second in Mark, uh, mentioned in Mark chapter 1, uh, verse 39, and here we have the third. And rather than this power, the divine power being restrained, we find in these verses that 
the divine power is being reproduced in the twelve disciples. Uh, back in Mark chapter 3, if we were to look at verses 13 through 19 of that chapter, we read that Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. They, these are the twelve he appointed, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Uh, to them he gave the name Boanerges, which means sons of thunder, Andrew, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. He was calling them, friends, to be under his instruction, to be under his tutelage. He, he called them to be with him with a view that he would eventually send them out with this message, with this good news, in his place. But here in Mark chapter 6, they're going forth as his truly, as his glorious heralds of his message. So the time has come, and these men, having been at the master's feet, you know, now is the time when they have to be launched out in service for him. He's sending them, Mark says in verse 7. Uh, of our uh, of our text this morning in Mark chapter six, he sends them forth. Now, uh, the uh, Greek word there is uh, apostello, the word that we get uh, apostle from. Apostle means sent one. Apostello to send them is what we read there. Literally, to send forth as an ambassador on a commission to represent another and to perform some task. Now, here in this uh, moment that we're in today, in, in this time, in, in this age where we are as the church uh, of Jesus Christ, we find that we're also, in a sense, ambassadors for the Lord Jesus Christ. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20, Paul said, we are, therefore, Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. So really, friends, there's, there's much application for us today in a similar, though not an exact position, uh, but we too are representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in, in this day, in this time, in this generation. So, like the early disciples, the twelve, you know, uh, you know, those twelve apostles, we should be with them. We should be with them. You know, and that's our primary responsibility. It should be, it ought to be our priority to be with him, to walk with him, and to talk with him. You know, I mean, this makes sense, but, you know, it's worth mentioning that it is no good serving the Lord Jesus if, if we're not spending time with him, if we're not spending time at his feet, much like the disciples did, learning from him and his perfect instruction. He called them first. We just read it in Mark chapter 3. He called them first to be with him. He appointed 12, it says, that they might be with him. That's first and foremost. That's the priority. And then there had to come a time when they were uh, no longer with him, but with others. And here we see this uh, realized in Mark chapter 6. He is sending them out. He's sending them forth. He is launching them out into service for him. And I wonder this morning if we if we know that that balance, right? You know, do do we have that order intact uh, in our uh, in our Christian walk? 
and our personal experiences with Christ. First, here's the order, to be with Him. That's first and foremost. We have to be with Him. And then, launched out into service. If we try it out of order, we're not going to be of much good to Him. We have to be with Him. He sent us forth. And uh, we're, we're out there. We're, we're spreading the good news. I hope. Right? Uh, now, um, Judaism it recognized, it understood a, a kind of uh, legal uh, recognition that an action performed by authorized individuals on the behalf of another was considered as the actual action of the person represented. The, the, their Jewish law of the time, right there, that law of the land, it acknowledged the sent one as the person who commissioned him. So if you're appointed as a representative in the legal sense of the term, you were that person. And in keeping with that thought, we find uh, in verse uh, 30 of this chapter that the, it says they're having come back from their mission at that point, the text says in verse 30 that the apostles gathered around Jesus, right? And look what it says. And reported to him all they had done and taught. All they had done and taught. They were reporting to him because they'd been operating on his behalf, right? As if he was operating. And, and really that fits in so well with the the theme of this portion of text because what we are, are witnessing here is not the power of the apostles, but it's the power of the Lord Jesus Christ reproduced in his representatives. And um, like us today, as ambassadors for Christ, as apostles with a small a, right? With the, there, there were only 12, right? Right? But as ones he has sent out to represent him, we are called upon to reproduce his power. So, how did he send them out? Well, verse 7 uh, of Mark chapter 6 says, he began to send them out two by two, right? He sent them out in pairs. Now, uh, Mark alone notes that the Lord Jesus sent the twelve out two by two, I believe. Uh, Luke uh, chapter 10, uh, verse 1, notes that the Lord sent out the 70, or 72, the 70, he sent them out two by two. It does mention that. But, but why did he send them out, as, you know, here in verse 7, why did he send them out two by two? Well, I, I, I went off on a little trail with this. I hope you don't, I hope you don't mind, but I, 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 didn't, I didn't stop myself. I just went, I just went with it. So, uh, well, I, I think one answer to that question might be that it, it gives them authenticity in a legal sense. As they were bringing testimony, the, the, Lord, the law required that in the, uh, in the mouth of uh, two or three witnesses, a truth should be established. So they were going out to propagate this, the, the truth of this message from Christ on his behalf, as his representatives, and it would fulfill the law's requirements that they went in twos, right? Now, in addition to that, we read in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verse 19, that the Lord Jesus said, Matthew 18, 19, again, truly I tell you that if two of you on earth Agree about anything they ask for, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. And friends, I, I, there is great strength in praying with other people and operating in service with other people, not just, not just on your own. So prayer ministry just would have been multiplied in going two by two, right? And I think another reason for sending them out two by two may simply be 
that it gives encouragement, right? That it gives companionship and cooperation. And it may just be for that simple reason that the Lord sent them out as such, to encourage one another, to have someone with them, to be that companion, to be someone to work with, to cooperate closely with. Solomon said in, a, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 9 and going through the first part of verse 12, Ecclesiastes 4, beginning in verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. Also, if two lie down together, they'll keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. And so what Solomon tells us that when we go out with company to serve the Lord, we have assistance, we have comfort, and then we have a defense as well. And then he says in that second part of verse 12 that three, additional to two, also has with it uh, its advantage. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. And actually, to be honest, this is perhaps uh, fulfilled in the Lord Jesus sending the disciples out two by two because the Lord Jesus, he sent them in twos, but he was working with them and he was working in them so that in the two disciples and the Lord Jesus empowering them, there is really a threefold cord of fellowship that is not easily broken. And I, I just... I just love that imagery. Now, we see that, um, that that's something that was uh, reciprocated, really, uh, throughout the entire ministry of the apostles. Not necessarily, not necessarily that they went out two by two, but they all went in cooperation with the Lord Jesus. They all went out in cooperation with the Lord Jesus. If we were to go to the very end of this book of Mark, uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 20, says, Then the disciples went out and preached everywhere, and the Lord worked with them and confirmed his word by the signs that accompanied it. And really, friends, that's, that's exactly what we're seeing and, and finding here in Mark chapter 6, the two in cooperation, but all of them, both of them, in cooperation with the Lord. And friends, in truly uh, effective service for the Lord, we need to be in fellowship with one another and in fellowship also with the Lord. Now, uh, should we be going out uh, two by two? You know, do we need to be obeying those words literally today? You know, how on earth would we apply that, uh, you know, th that word of God in our own, uh, you know, uh, contemporary situation? Well, I think there are a few problems if we were to obey those verses uh, literally. The first being in Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 5, where it says these 12 Jesus uh, sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. So when the Lord Jesus sent out the, the, and launched, just sent forth the twelve in this manner, he didn't send them to the Gentiles. In fact, what we read there is that he expressly told them not to go to them, but rather to the lost sheep of Israel. Uh, so if we're to obey these commands literally, we're not allowed to go and preach to the Gentiles, but to the Jews. Uh, obvi it's obvious that there's something uh, different going on in this portion. And then in Matthew chapter 10, verse 7, the Lord Jesus says, Matthew 10, 7, As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. And that's a different message than we're called to preach uh, today, right? The kingdom of heaven was at hand for these Jews because their Messiah was with them in the land, offering himself to them as their Messiah. Well, you know, he's, he's, not, he's not in the land today, 
and that same message is not being preached today. So it was a different message, and they were told to go to a different people. Now, if you were to go to Luke chapter 22, uh, verses 35 and 36, Luke 22, beginning in verse 35, then Jesus asked them, When I sent you without purse, bag, or, or sandals, did you lack anything? Nothing, they answered. He said to them, But now if you have a purse, take it, and also a bag. And if you don't have a sword, sell your cloak and buy one. You know, the, these commandments, these instructions that we're looking at this morning in Mark chapter 6 were particular commands to particular disciples to fulfill very specific stages of the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ while he was here on the earth. Of course, now, in Matthew chapter 28, we have the final commission of the Lord Jesus to the twelve. And we know it well in verses 19 and 20 of Matthew chapter 28. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And, you know, this was another message, you know, a message that wasn't just to the Jew. But this was a message to the global nations. It is a message of grace through faith, and it's a message that we still carry today, right? And we'll continue to carry. You know, you know. Further though, when you know, if, if we go even further into the book of Acts, you know, we find that the church didn't practice these instructions. The apostles didn't practice them either, literally. Now. Sometimes they did, obviously, they sent people out in twos, but other times they sent people out alone. And still, you know, some were sent out in a company of eight, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> right? You know, so they didn't obey these, those verses literally. So all of this to say, we have to be careful, uh, you know, that we're not applying things literally that were commands that were intended for a specific person or people um, at a particular time in biblical history. Now, again, all that being said, there are general principles that are found in these instructions in Mark chapter 6 that are related to service, that service and our service, because these principles that we see here are just timeless, and we can absolutely apply them uh, today. You know, and uh, really the first one is, uh, I already mentioned, and that's if we're to have effective service for the Lord, we have to be in fellowship with one another, and we have to be in fellowship with the Lord. And then the second we find in uh, that second part of verse 7 in, um, in Matthew, uh, not Matthew, in Mark chapter 6, and again, looking at that verse, calling the twelve to him, he began to send them out two by two, as we read, and look, and gave them authority over impure, evil, unclean, right? Whatever your translation says, spirits. He sent them in pairs, but friends, don't miss this. Not only did he send them out in pairs, but he sent them out with authority and power. Right? Now, now here we're, we're seeing the one who, remember last week what we were talking about in verses 1 through 6 of Mark chapter 6. Here's the one who could do no mighty works, not because he wasn't able, but because of the divine conditions of faith in the hearers, it wasn't meant. And now he's giving that power to others. And it's obviously a divine power, so the power is being reproduced. Listen, it is one thing to cast out demons, which the Lord did, but only God can, only God can confer these powers to others. That's it. You know, uh, uh, Darby uh, said, any can work miracles if God gives the power, but God alone can give it. That's it. Right? 
And so here we see the, the, the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's imparting the power to work miracles on earth. You know, friends, as, as the Lord Jesus wanted these disciples, these, the twelve, to serve him in power and authority, he wants us as well to serve him in power today. So that word that for authority that you see there in verse 7, as I've already mentioned, that's also the word for, for power. For power. He, he gave them authority over unclean spirits. You know, um, again, uh, and I, we, we never took the opportunity this time around, I think many years ago, I was in Mark chapter 1, anyway. Back in Mark chapter 1, uh, verses 26 and 27, the people were amazed. The people just marveled at the Lord Jesus because he cast out the demons. You know, they, they were all amazed at his power, and they asked each other, you know, what is this, <laughs> right? That's what it says in the text. What is this? A, a new teaching, and with authority. He even gives orders to impure spirits, and they obey him. And now he's giving this to the disciples. This same power and authority is being reproduced in his representatives. Right? Now, listen, we cannot do what the apostles did in many respects, right? But, but, the fact of the matter is, as far as as far as we're concerned, today, as followers and servants of the Lord Jesus, listen, we know the Lord Jesus Christ, he came down from heaven, he died on the cross, he was buried, he rose again, he went up to heaven, and after he went up to heaven, the Holy Spirit came down from heaven and absolutely empowered the church to go out and to into this world and to touch men and women for, well, for heaven, right? You know, that their souls might be saved, right? That they would not perish. They would know the name of Jesus and come to him and know life eternal. Friends, you know, we're to serve the Lord with his own divine power. You see that word gave there in, uh, in verse 7 of Matthew chapter um, the second time I've done that, Mark chapter 6, right? But you look at verse 7, calling the twelve to him, he sent them out two by two and gave them. He gave them that authority, he gave them that power. Friends, that word gave is in the imperfect tense, and that means he kept on giving them the power throughout their, their, their you know, that ministry, that ministry tour of Galilee, he kept on doing it. That's the idea there. It was a timeless, limitless supply of power. And I want to, now, for us, that should elicit a hallelujah because that is available to us. And uh, I think it was Warren Worsby who said that God's commandments are always his enablements. I know that's where I read that. God's commandments are always his enablements. I like that. Paul said, the Apostle Paul said in uh, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, beginning in verse 5, not that we are confident in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our confidence comes from God. He made us confident as ministers of a new covenant, not the letter, right? Not the letter of the law, right? But of the Spirit, for that letter kills, right? But the Spirit gives life. The Spirit gives life. You know, it, it, you know, I, I wonder if we know that power in our lives today. Do we, do we really know that? Do we know it in our service for the Lord? You, may, you know, uh, Phillips Brooks 
said, do not pray for, and you guys know this quote well, I'm sure, do not pray for tasks equal to your powers, pray for powers equal to your tasks. You know, and it makes sense, you know, why pray for tasks equal to your powers? Because your powers, my powers are feeble, right? Pathetic. But pray for divine powers equal for your tasks, for those things that God is calling you and I to do. Right? That it just makes sense. So how did, how did he send them out? The Lord Jesus sent out the twelve in pairs. He sent them out with authority and power. And really, thirdly, he sent them out with the promise of provision. Uh, if we look at verses 8 through 10 of our text this morning, Mark chapter 6, it says, These were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey, except the staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but you know, don't take that extra tunic, that extra shirt, right? Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. Now, I, I went off on a I went off on a little trail again. Forgive me for it, but I do hope that it's helpful. You know, it's at this point where there are some who encounter a little bit of a, a problem uh, with the Word of God, um, that potential problem being that the Lord Jesus tells them in Matthew chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, in the same instance, right, that we're thinking of here in Mark chapter 6, Matthew chapter 10, beginning in verse 9, do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts, right? No bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or staff, for the worker is worth his keep. Now Mark in his record, he says the Lord Jesus told him to take sandals and staff, and that's a problem uh, that some might have. In Luke chapter 9, verse 3, he records that the Lord told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Again, uh, no staff is to be taken. Now, uh, there are some friends uh, who try to reconcile this by saying that, these, uh, that the staff that they weren't allowed to take with them uh, you know, was, a, uh, was a, a fighting staff, right, for defense, but they were permitted uh, to take with them a walking stick, a walking staff, to get over the uh, rough terrain. And some of these same people would try to reconcile these verses by saying that the shoes here are, are different than uh, sandals. And you know what? Listen, that may be the case, but uh, it seems best, I think, to understand these accounts as reporting two different parts of a larger set of instructions in which Jesus told the twelve not to acquire new supplies, but that they should take the essential supplies needed for their ministry, for their journey. In other words, take the staff and the sandals that you already have. Don't get new ones. And I think that that interpretation is uh, completely in keeping with the whole meaning of this portion. The whole idea, whether you Matthew chapter 10, Luke chapter 9, Mark chapter 6, the whole idea is that Jesus is saying, don't take extra provisions to rely on, you know, on, on your own ingenuity, but rely on my promise of provision. That's what it is. It's his promise. He's telling them, I'll care for you. You know, don't go out and, and take this or, or get anything new. Take what you have, right? Take the staff you already have, the sandals you already have. Trust me. Trust me to provide, he says. Now, um, of course, a, a second problem that we might have uh, is that in the light of... Uh, 
really what I read earlier, if you remember, in Luke chapter 22, verses 35 and 36. I read that a little earlier. You know, should we assume that because this particular instruction in Mark chapter 6 was revoked by the Lord himself, that the Lord's provision would, you know, would no longer be given? Of course not. Of course not. In fact, you know, the Lord says, if I can read it again, verse 35 of Luke chapter 22, when I sent you without purse, bag, or sandals, did you lack anything? What was their response? Nothing, they answered. And that was the lesson he was trying to get across to them. In Luke chapter 22, the, the, the point is that they were about they were about to face, think about it, Luke 22, they're about to face the worst opposition and hostility that they, that they ever met in their first mission. And therefore, it was really important that they learn how to trust the Lord without anything. So, you know, the command that we see in Mark chapter 6, verses 8 and 9, was to take no bread, no bag. And friends, when it mentions that bag there, that's literally a uh, beggar's bag, is what's being spoken of there. And they were absolutely, they were, <laughs> they were definitely not to beg for food or for money. Don't do that. No extra tunic, no extra shirt, right? Or money in their belts, only the sandals that they had, perhaps for protecting their feet, you know, and only the staff that they had, and perhaps that was uh, for protection uh, from wild animals, I don't know. Perhaps it was just for helping them, I like a walking stick to get them over that rugged terrain, I don't know. But listen, the idea is that they were to trust in the Lord for everything else. Trust in the Lord! You know, there wasn't any... <laughs> There, there wasn't any danger of these disciples, of these apostles, being uh, envied because of their possessions as they went out on their journey. No one's going to look at them and say, wow, wish I, wish I was doing that, wish I was them, right? You know, it, in, in worldly terms, the world looking at them, they were, they were completely unattractive, you know? There's nothing, you know, because the world is attracted to those who have, right? In a very real sense, those with the many possessions, with, you know, with great wealth, and, you know, and what they're able to do with that, right? There's an attraction to that. These disciples had none of that, but they were attractive in that they manifested divine power, right? And, you know, that was the attraction, if, if any. It was because they had the likeness and the power of Christ in them. And I, I just, I, I think that's a lesson uh, for us, uh, certainly. You know, um, then in verse 10, um, verse 10 uh, of Mark chapter 6, they were told, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. Why? Well, why would they be given that instruction? Well, you know, it, it stopped them, really, from going on a search for more comfortable accommodations. Just stay where you are. You don't, you don't, you don't need to go out and look for more comfortable lodging, right? <laughs> you know, stay where you are. The Lord Jesus was helping his disciples to realize at that... Look, he's like, your mission is one of life and death to those who would hear. You know, and that's what he's trying to get across to them. Everything else is secondary. That's the idea. Everything else is secondary. You know, and I, I wonder, and I, there were many times going through this that I, I felt the conviction upon me. You know, is that how we operate? Is that how we operate? You know, they were being sent out as representatives of the one who did not please himself, right? That's not what Jesus was about. 
You know, Jesus was not self-seeking, and you know, and, and they weren't to compromise the message by seeking any sort of luxury or comfort or ease. And that's why, actually, and I was thinking back to, I don't know how long ago it was that I was preaching uh, from this, but you might recall that this is why the apostolic church, they could say, like, you remember Peter, and he's saying this to the lame man outside the gate called Beautiful, right? He says those words to him, silver or gold I do not have, Acts chapter 3, verse 6. Silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have, I give you. Are you hearing those words? And then he says, in the name of Jesus of Christ of Nazareth, walk, walk. Power and authority. You know, you know <laughs> that's what he had. He had the name, you know, right? We talked all about this, we, and, uh, and I preached on this, but I, I thought that was, uh, you know, that's what they could say. That's what they could say. You know, and it's hard, I think, for the, the modern church today to say that. You know, sometimes, not all the time, but at times, I think it is because I would, you know, I think there are often times where we just we rely on our own resources uh, rather than uh, on God's uh, supernatural provision. And, uh, and I'm convicted of that, you know, I, there's times, you know, I, so, but we need to hear that, we need to understand that, and we really do need to rely on not trusting so much on our own resources, but on what God provides. You know, we, uh, we learn from these instructions in, uh, that we read in verses uh, 8, 9, and 10, of Mark chapter 6 that you and I we need if we're servants of the Lord if we're followers of Christ in this time you know we need dependence on the Lord we don't need dependence on on wealth you know what we need and the idea here is and what the disciples needed we need faith we need faith and that minimum of provision that they had was to call these disciples out in the maximum of faith, the minimum of provision. In that, the Lord teaches them to go out in that maximum faith. You know, that, that's the whole idea there. They, they, didn't have, they didn't have any resources. And so they just had to totally cast themselves upon the Lord. That's it. That's it. And what the Lord was teaching the servant was, look, as long as, the, he's telling them, as long as you're doing my work, I'll supply your need. And I believe those are the words to us today. As long as you're doing my work, he says, I will supply your need. I'll be there to provide for you, to supply you, to equip you with what you need to do that good work, to do those great exploits in my name, he says. You know, and uh, I think we see this exemplified in Paul's uh, letter to Timothy uh, when he said these words. I want to read to you these words from 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, verses 6 through 10. 1 Timothy 6, beginning in verse 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world, and we can take Nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we'll be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into the temptation and a trap and into many foolish and, and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all uh, kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pierce themselves with many griefs. And again, and you've probably heard this said, but I'll say it anyway. You know, I, he's not saying it's wrong uh, to have some money in your pocket, but it, it becomes wrong to depend upon that resource and not uh, depend on God. 
And of course, the idea there is running after more money can actually push us away from faith into error and then compounding misery and uh, actually, you know, that word there, pierce themselves with many griefs, miseries, and uh, I, I believe it's in the Aramaic, the word there too can bring about the idea of demons, and it really is, it's the thought of in, inviting them into our lives, miseries and, and evils into our lives. And, and that comes from just an insatiable greed that could develop, right? And that's what we're to that's what we're warned of. You know, the disciples' great profit, if they if they profited from anything, they profited from their holy awe of God. Right? I mean, that's what it was. You know, and you know, they, they had little. But they saw the mighty things they were able to do, not of themselves, but the power of God. God working with them, and God working in them. And um, I wonder, I was wondering for myself, but I wonder, you know, for all of us, you know, in our service to God, you know, I, maybe I'm distracted sometimes by the, the resources, uh, and not as profiting as much as I should from just the awe, you know, the, that awe of what God does working through me, working with me. I'm not doing anything on my own. We don't want to lose that is what I'm saying. We don't want to lose that. Don't lose that. <laughs> Let's, let's stay in awe of God and what he does. You know, we can't claim anything for ourselves, but it's God. You know, the, you know we, we have to serve in faith. That sure thing is, is faith, not our faith, you know, but God's faith for sure. You know, our resources, friends, our resources, and our resources, whether they're financial, whether they're technological, I would say even if they're intellectual resources, whatever the case might be, none of them are sure, but God is sure. Amen? He is sure, and our dependence has to be with Him and Him alone. And, uh, you know, the servant of the Lord needs to depend on the Lord, not on wealth. And that's faith. That's faith. Secondly, uh, the servant of the Lord has to be willing, must be willing, when it's called upon him or her, to relinquish comfort. And again, I, I found myself convicted. You know, I, you know, if, if the first attribute is faith, the second has to be sacrifice. You know, and listen, I'll be, I'll, I'll admit, my flesh in the flesh. I love, I love myself some pampering and some luxury. You be honest with yourself. <laughs> and, and you can say whether or not you love that. You know, you know hey, you know, but listen, it, it's actually not ideal for the servant of the cross. You know, William MacDonald, you heard his words. Uh, he, he said, so disciples must make a deliberate choice. He says, on the one hand, there's poverty, hunger, tears, and unpopularity for the Son of Man's sake. You know, right? And then he says, on the other, there's riches abundant, food, gaiety, and man's approval. He says, those who choose the latter receive their reward now and remorse later. Those who choose the former inherit the kingdom with all the joys that go with it. You tell me that's not <laughs> you tell me that's not convicting. That's rough. It's hard. You know, but truly the Lord Jesus was the poor servant of Jehovah who did not please himself and yet and yet he's able to pledge himself to provide the needs of his servants, his disciples if they go out with 
What? Nothing. Right? Isn't that, that's unbelievable. It's awesome. But we have to believe it. Do we believe it? You know, we have to believe it. You know, do we believe it and do we act upon it? It's, it's staggering. It's, it really is. He sent them out in pairs. He sent them out with power. He sent them out with authority. He sent them out with a promise that he would provide. And in verse 11, we see that he sent them out prepared for rejection. You know, he, he said, And if any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. They were not obliged, friends, to remain and uh, like uh, the Lord said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 6. They weren't obliged to stay there and throw out their pearls, right, in front of wild pigs, right? You know, and I say that, you know, when we're thinking of what the Lord said back in Matthew 7, 6, you know, those pearls are symbols of spiritual truths that are given to us by God, which are not to be regarded lightly or to be shared with those whose hearts are closed. You know, they're in, in public testimony against those who rejected the message of Christ. They were to shake the dust off their feet, uh, which was symbolizing God's rejection of the hearers. And the Jews often did this when they... Uh, when they returned from the Gentile regions, right, those heathen places, right, they would shake the dust from off their feet as a, uh, as a form of cleansing. And the Lord is commanding them to do this against the Jews who rejected him as their Messiah. And I, I don't want us to misunderstand this at all. So, you know, listen, the disciples weren't called by the Lord to be, they weren't called to be rude. And they weren't called to be hostile in their approach, and neither are we. We're, we're not called to be rude. We're not called to be hostile in our approach at all. This, but this right here, specifically in Mark chapter 6, this was actually a very merciful, prophetic act. You know, this was intended to really shock. It was, though, a little bit to shock the hearers into realizing that the judgment of God was upon them. It was really, that act was designed to get them into thinking about their destiny and, and standing before God Almighty. And ultimately, it was really a pronouncement of judgment that was to bring them to the very thing that the disciples were preaching. Repent. It was to bring them to repentance. And it wasn't just for the time when our Lord was upon the earth. It wasn't. If you were to look at Acts chapter 13, I'm not going to take the time to do that. We're almost out of time this morning. But in Acts chapter 13, we read that Paul and Barnabas, they did this. They shook the dust from off their feet uh, when the citizens of uh, Antioch in uh, the region of Pisidia, they rejected the gospel of God's grace. So they shook the dust off their feet. You know, friends, servants of the Lord, this is the teaching and instruction for us this morning. They, they need faith, they need sacrifice, and we see here at the end in these final verses, uh, we see that they, you know, they need, they need truthfulness. They need directness. You know, they need to be prepared to preach judgment, right? And, and there is a sense of urgency here. Now, I, you know, I'm looking here um, in, a, in the NIV, here in the Bible in front of me, but, you know, there are some uh, Greek manuscripts that add a, a sentence to the end of uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 11. Take this as you will. I think if you were to look in the King. The King James Version, you'd see these words, but, you know, sometimes you see those words added, truly, I tell you, that it'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. You know, take it for what you will, right? But, you know, friends, those who reject Christ are, are in a sense, they're in a worse situation, you know, than Sodom and Gomorrah. And, friends, fire rained down from heaven upon them. Listen, we've heard the gospel 
we have the Bible in our hands, you know. There was a time. Do you remember that time before COVID when we'd, when we'd gather, right? You know, we were able to sit in gatherings and meetings together and, and hear the word and, and sing to God and, and all of these things. And there's so much that they never had and God judged them. God judged them because they rejected him with less than what we have. Anyway, moving on, uh, you know, uh, verse tw the truthfulness and the directness of the 12 was absolutely evident in their preaching. Mark chapter 8, verse 12 says that they went out and they preached that people should repent. And please note again that preaching was their main task. They went, you know, they were to preach the gospel and then it was the preaching that led to what we read in verse 13, the expulsion of, uh, of evil spirits and demons and the healing of the sick. You know, they preached to them. That has to be first. They preached to them. And the word that's used there in verse 12 for preach is keruso. Uh, and it literally means to make, friends, a public proclamation with such gravity and formality and authority as must be heeded. I often wonder if that's the three ingredients in our preaching. And I have to say our. It's, don't, please don't put it just on the me. As a preacher, we're all preaching the gospel, right? We're all to proclaim the word and the truth, right? As we do that, do we have those ingredients? Do we go out, you know, is it the gravity and formality and the authority? Meaning the, you know, you know, do, do we have that, that, that passion? Do we have that truthfulness and that d directness, you know, the message they preached was repent. They're saying to them, change your attitude toward God. Change your attitude toward self. Change your attitude toward sin. And in verse 13, those were the signs that followed. They anointed uh, many sick people with oil, and they were healed. And I think the oil there is symbolic uh, of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. And uh, really, we as believers should be anointed with that holy oil of God's spirit as we serve him in effective power. It's new. I need to close. So let me say this as we uh, close this morning. What's effective power that will reproduce the power of the Lord Jesus? It's everything we talked about this morning. It is fellowship with one another. And it's, in, and it's that fellowship with one another in the fellowship of the Lord. It's that, um, that availing of, of the divine power which he gives us constantly with a limitless supply. It's a dependence on the Lord, not on wealth. And that's faith. And it's readiness to relinquish comfort. I know. And that's sacrifice. And these things are not easy for us at times, I know. And it's a preparedness to preach the truth faithfully. And when I thought, how do I measure up? You know, sometimes, friends, you know, it's convicting. It really is. The Lord Jesus says later in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, whoever wants to be my disciples must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And friends, in that powerful, in those powerful words, we see that it's not only the dethroning of our lives, but it's the enthroning of Christ. And that's what we need. So let me go to the Lord in, in prayer. Let's close. Thank you for uh, sticking with me a little longer this morning. Lord, thank you for your powerful word to us. May we be a people of faith. Um, it's hard, Lord, at times. And I would say, Lord, that it's really hard in these days. These are difficult days in many of us. I believe even believers. And I would say even in myself. It's like we're looking for comfort. You know, we're looking for things that would put us more at ease especially in these days. And um, I, 
I pray, though, that we wouldn't go all out seeking the things of this world or things that the world, you know, the world might look at us and, and find us more uh, attractive in a sense if we had, if we just had more and more of this. Maybe we're just looking for those things to, to fill whatever voids during this time, Lord, but I pray that you'd help us to be a people who would uh, remember the uh, whole theme of faith, Lord, and, and sacrifice, and, and just knowing, Lord, that there are times where we'll struggle and we'll be without as we follow you, but, but you still give us and supply us and so much more than what the world could ever do. And um, it's all for your name's sake, and not for us, you know, that we might be glorified, but that your name might be glorified and magnified, and that people may be saved, souls might be saved, so that they wouldn't perish but that they may join us in uh, an eternal life with you, Lord. So I pray that you continue to go out with us, work with us and through us, give us the, and help us to know that power and to, um, as we proclaim the good news to a world that desperately needs to hear it. We uh, just bring these things before you in Christ Jesus' name.